On today's episode, we explore this idea, how can you make the impossible possible? Brad and I share our favorite video clip of the week, and Jillian from Montana Money Adventures joins us on the show to help us design a roadmap to a better life. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. So excited to hop into this past week's episode with Billy from Wealth Well Done. In particular, talk about this idea of making the impossible possible. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. And and yeah, this episode was just so energizing. I think you and I, we've just been talking before we hit record and we're just so fired up. And I think honestly, it has a lot to do with this episode with Billy. Yeah. I mean, I, I said in the episode, I want to go run around the block. I finished the episode and I went and I ran around the block, man. I mean, that was just, <laughs> how could you not? My day was better as a result of recording that episode with him. And in particular, that, that phrase that I led with, it spoke to me about this idea of grit. And one of the reasons I mentioned that is I was watching this video with you earlier and it's on Facebook right now. In fact, we're actually going to post it up on our Facebook page when this episode goes live. And it's about this father that wants to spend time with his daughter that's a gymnast and probably she's probably about Anna's age, somewhere in that range. He is like us, right? I mean, maybe not out of shape, but like not in like incredible shape or anything. And he wants to spend time with her. That's his guiding light. And he says, you know what? If that means that I'm going to learn gymnastics and I'm going to practice next to her, that's what I'm going to do. And you can tell when he starts that this is not his thing. This is not something that he's comfortable with. And he falls and he falls and he falls and he falls. And it looks, sometimes it looks painful, he just kept getting back up and there was this progress that was built into it that, I mean, that there's, it's understandable why this video on Facebook is going viral, but frankly, it was inspirational to me and it speaks to so much of what we're talking about in this episode. Yeah, I totally agree. I watched this a couple of times after you told me about it. It's amazing to watch this guy. Like you said, at the beginning, it kind of looks like he's going to break his neck pretty much every <laughs> single time, right? Yeah. But he keeps getting back up. It's just about spending time with his daughter. Obviously, you can use spending time with your daughter as, as a proxy for whoever's important in your life. Where can you find some unusual place that shows this little bit that I'm willing to give for this relationship? I think that's the important part that I took away. It was just so important to this guy to spend this quality time with his daughter. And life lesson-wise, it's unbelievable, right? I mean, think about it from the perspective of his daughter. This means so much to my dad that he's willing to look like a fool repeatedly. He's willing to learn a skill that he could have never contemplated he would do. And also, again, putting myself in the daughter's point of view, I get to teach this to my dad. I know I'm thinking about this now with swimming with my kids. I'm a reasonable swimmer, but I never learned how to swim properly. I could have both of my daughters teach me how to do a legal 50 butterfly to imagine right now that I could do a 50 butterfly legally and not DQ is almost impossible, but it wouldn't shock me if by the end of the summer, if we actually worked on it every single day, if I could do that. And that's a cool thing for life, you know, to those of you that are saying, man, I got to see this clip. It's going to be hosted on our Facebook page. You can just go to facebook.com slash choose FI. How do you make the impossible possible? And I think in many cases you do it by removing the limiting belief, just simply changing the frame. Billy made the case to us in this episode that there's two ways of looking at the world. And one of them is very scary, that the possible is impossible. And he said, and how many of us put ourselves in that situation constantly? And I think it goes back to what uh, Dominic Cortuccio was talking about in designing your future and talking about these idea of limiting beliefs and drifts. We just create an environment in which we can't succeed. If you can just get to the side of that and say, I'm the type of person that can learn anything. I'm the type of person that can make the impossible possible. How do you do that? 
first just say that out loud and then you apply grit to something. And it doesn't mean that you have to do this alone, that you know you have to suddenly have this epiphany, but you just apply yourself to that. Do you want to learn how to, I mean, I'm going to use just examples like he, you know, in the, in this particular case, you want to learn how to woodwork. You want to learn how to ski. You want to learn how to break dance. You want to learn how to do gymnasts. You want to learn how to play piano, start a business, whatever it may be. Once you decide that the impossible, what was before impossible is possible, then you need to position yourself to receive good information and apply that information. And it is not going to work on day one and it's not going to be pretty. You know, you are likely going to crash and that's okay. That's okay. Because as long as you say that is part of the process, that is a part of kind of this sharpening the steel, you get back up and you try again. And then the, over the course of this two minute video, I watched this dad crash and burn like some odd 40 to 50 times. And by the end, he's not a professional gymnast. He's not the best in the world. He's not going to the Olympics, but oh my goodness, he can do stuff that I can't do. (laughs) Yeah. He's dramatically better. And there are so many quotes from this episode with Billy that, I mean, I wrote down Jonathan, honestly, like two pages of just straight quotes. It took me took me quite a long time to do this because I had to stop every five (laughs) seconds. It felt like to write something down. You know, he's talking about the shame of the drugs and and this prison sentence. And he's saying, you know what? I don't have to be this person forever. And he said, I'd see the visions of who I wanted to be and what I could be. And I don't know where this thought came from, but I realized the gap to get me from who I am today into the person that I want to be in my future was practicing the skills that could get me there. That is a remarkable mindset. How many people make mistakes in life or just had, had a tough go at it, right? For any number of reasons. They had a a bad childhood. They got into drugs. They got in trouble with the law and they think that defines them forever. That's a normal thought process, sadly. And Billy rejected that entirely. I don't know where he did this, how this is possible that at this point, a, a 21, 22 year old kid had the mental wherewithal to say like, I don't have to let this mistake. And it was a horrible mistake, obviously, but I don't have to let this define me for the rest of my life. It's amazing. And Brad, (laughs) I have a feeling we could spend our entire show with our takeaways from this episode just because it altered my worldview on what is possible. And, you know, we talk about, and this has been a point of encouragement for us, that regardless of how bad you have it, right, just whatever circumstances that you're dealing with that you say are impossible, you can't pursue financial independence because of this set of circumstances, somebody somewhere has had it worse than you have it now and they figured out a way to make it work. They figured out a way to get a different result. And that's not a judgment on on you. It's just saying if you can take that and realize that that is possible, if you can shift that mindset and I'm start of looking at all the reasons you can't, find just a single way that you can improve in some small way. What doors and opportunities does that open up for you? That is to me the most encouraging thing and it's a driving light for our mission, our purpose on this show, because Brad, frankly, we cannot speak Billy's message for him. That is not our life experiences. We've had a very blessed life. It's been a relatively straight path with, you know, maybe the own obstacles that we've had to work through. We have not had to work through what Billy's had to work through. So how does someone that has had that similar path look at our path and say, yes, that's possible. We realize that we realize that very early on. And as a result, this show is not you know, two gurus trying to tell you this is the one path. It's our path. Rather, it's two very curious guys that are going out there and saying, how have other people tackled this? And how can we create a conversation and highlight it so that we can help as many people as possible together? And that's why a community is critical, critical to the story, critical to the Phi journey. Yeah, you're right. And one of the things that Billy did to make this successful life was to set goals. And he said he started from the absolute bottom when he got out of setting a goal of getting a $9 per hour job. And then he said, quote, just because you set your first goals doesn't mean you have to live with those forever. Then you're like, okay, I got my first set of goals. Now that's not enough for me. What's the next set of goals I can hit? And he's talking about this philosophy of success, right? He said, I studied the philosophy of failure, which I had become. And then I studied the philosophy of success, which is who I wanted to be. And just because you fail doesn't mean you're a failure, right? That doesn't have to be how you look at yourself for the rest of your life. He's talking about increasing the odds of success by having all of these skills. And he talked about 
how can I make myself so good at certain things that I can control in here, such as reading, writing, talking, that when I get out, I'm good at these things that my skills cannot be denied. Right, Jonathan? I mean, that's like chill inducing when you hear it. This mindset, he knew he wasn't going to get out of jail and have a hundred thousand dollar a year job waiting for him. He set his goal of a $9 per hour job, but he built skills and he has used those to great effect in the subsequent years. And Brad, when you look at those skills, it actually reminds me, what were we talking about just last week on the past Friday roundup? The power of communication skills. Billy is able to communicate his vision for the future, his goals, his dreams, his aspirations. He's able to sell this vision and it has carried him places. And, and it strikes me that there are multiple ways to communicate. This isn't all a verbal process. We all have different strengths. And when I think about, you know, just frankly, in between me and you, our different skill set, clearly I'm a very verbal guy and you've been able to develop this skill set. Like in your own words, I've, I've grown into this, but, but beyond that, when I look at like the success that you've achieved long before that you are cultivating the skill set, your ability to communicate in writing was amazing. We really didn't talk about this before, but frankly, like I just defer to you on a lot of the longer communication that we do because your ability to parse your ideas together and create something to sell a vision essentially by an email is just, I mean, frankly, it's unparalleled. I've, no one in my social circle can do what you do. And, and, and I just, that's interesting because maybe people, you know, kind of line up different on the spectrum, but whether or not you're talking about verbal or written, most, you know, most people aren't given that same exact skill set, but it's important, whichever way your strengths are, not to ignore the other completely, but also both of those are equally powerful, equally potent. You think about writers that have changed the world through their written word, not through their public speeches. Communication is just so valuable. And I wanted to almost circle back because Billy, in his case, really obviously cultivated both of them, but it, when he was in prison for 10 years, it wasn't public speaking, was it? It was, it was absolutely studying and writing for him that focused his thoughts into a pinpoint spear that really was a guiding light for him going into the, the rest of his life. Yeah, Jonathan, obviously, thank you for the compliments. I appreciate it. Writing, I think, is something that is underrated, but is really important. A lot of people, especially in this day and age, just kind of word vomit onto an email or onto whatever it is they're writing. And, and sometimes even just simple grammar makes a big difference. I edit what I'm writing. I don't just jot something down and send it off if it's something important. And I also think about the other person. I think this is generally how I've looked at communication, both verbal and written in the last, I mean, who knows, 10 years, maybe more, but certainly in the last handful of years, I think it's become increasingly important to me is, is looking at the person receiving that message. And also like, what are their motivations? How can you persuade them by getting your point across best? Like understanding their point of view, I think is absolutely essential. And that's even down to the format of what you're sending, right? Like I've learned this from blog writing, right? Jonathan, we talk about the talent stack and it's the way that I look at that is this holistic life experience. All right. So what I know when I read blogs is when I see a mountain of text, hundreds of words in one paragraph, my brain shuts off. I know I don't like reading that. This doesn't mean I have this short little attention span and I need like tiny little sentences, but what I find is, at least on that side, is much more attractive to me. So I even think about that down to the micro level when I'm sending an email, is if I look at something and there's this mountain of text, line after line after line, I look at that and say, I wouldn't wanna read this, why would I subject someone else to it? Anyway, we can get into the minutia of it, but I think the most important thing is put yourself in the other person's shoes. What is going to make them light up? What is going to resonate with them when you're either talking to them or sending them a, a message or an email or whatever it is, whatever way of communication, put yourself in the other person's shoes. And honestly, Brad, when you look at one of the big epiphanies Billy had, it's who are you surrounding yourself with? And he made the case that this is one of the reasons that he actually looked for the Phi community because when he looked around, he didn't see anybody that was good with money. So he couldn't just stay with this current social group. If he wanted to get a different result, he had to follow a different path. So he started actively seeking and that's how he stumbled onto yours truly here at Choose the Five, Mr. Money Mustache, J.L. Collins and company. He was looking actively, how can I, how can I do things better 
than my current knowledge base is affording me. And we talk about this quote. I mean, I, I actually, I'm committing to mentioning this quote every single week for the next 75 years. You're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. Look around. What does that mean for your current situation? The amazing thing is this does not need to be necessarily, I think in some part, it should be a physical reality. It should be an in real life deal, but not every single one of those contexts, not every single one of those needs to be a physical person in your life. This, it still works when you're listening and absorbing and taking action on that information. It's why reading blogs and listening to podcasts and just educating yourself with knowledge that you don't currently contain, it counts. It counts for some portion of that. Brad and I, Brad, do we count for one half of a person each? So we can be one person. If you're including us twice a week, you can count us as one. What are you doing about the other four? Yeah. Billy said, you need to live and breathe being a success. He kind of alluded to part of the journey of life is to make new connections that will help him in his current state. And he said, I was looking for people who were going somewhere in life. What a cool way of looking at it. I think, Jonathan, honestly, it can become almost cliche, like the you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah, it but, is, but I'm going to keep using it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I don't doubt it. But no, it's it's great. I mean, it really is. It's more important than you'd believe, right, than most people would believe. When, in Billy's case, you surround yourself with people who are getting into trouble, who are using drugs, did he believe that that would help him live and breathe being a success? No, of course not. He said he wasn't the same person he was now that he was 31, that he was at 20. This is somewhat obvious, right? When you take a step back, but it's not all that obvious because people fall back into the same patterns. He very easily could have gotten out of jail and went back to the same patterns that he knew. But out of anger grown... or resentment, right? Mm-hmm. Look at what I had to deal with. Well, now I'm just going to do what I want to do. I mean, these emotional triggers send people in different directions. Yeah, no, you're right. And I mean, clearly for him, his wife was obviously number one of those five people you spend the most time with, right? He said, we never disagreed about the big picture of where we wanted to go in our life. And we fell in love with the same vision of the life we wanted to live. And I just thought that was awesome. He obviously surrounded himself with people in his uh, faith community and people in the Phi community, his wife, it sounds like he has this amazing support system. I mean, the guy has been just a huge success. He accumulated almost $150,000 of net worth almost by accident, he said. They were just doing the right things because him and his wife had this vision of what they wanted their life to look like. Quote, so that we would never have to do something we didn't want to. And the only logical option, which I know, Jonathan, you thought was was hilarious in a, in a great way, right? The only logical option was save all your money so you never have to do something you don't want to do. I'm for it. How do you feel about it? I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I mean, to your point, that's not obvious, right? It's not the only logical option or else the savings rate in America and the world wouldn't be so abysmal, right? Absolutely. And you know, Brad, mindset is so important, but when you tie it to action, that's when you have a transformation. That's when you have results that shine so bright that everybody around you wants to know, what did you do? I mean, that's honestly, why are we asking Billy about his life with such intensity, such curiosity? Because his results are so radically different than what you would expect. And while mindset was, was great, what I love about you know the Phi community is we have demonstrable action that you can take to get results in a relatively short period of time. He lost a decade of his life, and he has a net worth now within a period of about six years of three hundred thousand dollars, and it's it's just getting e- easier. You know, there's there's something to be said for how much easier this path gets the farther you go down it. There's a quote by Zig Ziglar, which I'm going to paraphrase because I'm not intimately familiar with it, but basically this idea of you have this pump and when you start pumping this water, this manual pump outside, if you can imagine it, one of these old historic water well pumps, you're pumping it, you pump it for 20 or 30 seconds and nothing happens. You keep going, you get a couple drops, you get this, you know, a couple drops out of the spigot and then finally it opens and it floods and then you just, it's a torrent and you can't hold it back. It's kind of like that. Sometimes it's hard at the very beginning. It's hard to take that first step and you don't always get the results you're expecting on day one or day two. It's going to take persistence. It's going to take continuing down the path. And then at some point it starts to get a little bit easier. And at some point it's a torn at that point, it's almost difficult to get in the way 
of the result that you've created for yourself, the outcome that you've created for yourself. It's kind of hitting critical mass and then enjoying what happens. Like Brad, at this point, and honestly, even a couple of years ago, you had hit that, that threshold and things just kept getting easier and easier. But it wasn't like that on day one. There's that quote, easy choices, hard life, hard choices, easy life. And in your case, you made some hard choices. I mean, you left a very high cost of living area and you started over in an area where you were basically starting from scratch. You didn't have a, you didn't have five people around you, right? Uh, And you kind of had to recultivate that from the ground up. And then you could have taken the easy choice and always been able to finance the new cars and have the lifestyle that everybody expects you to have. But you bought your modest vehicles and you drove them forever, right? You never, you still haven't replaced them. I think your boy's going to hit 400,000 miles before you ever replace that sucker. That like seems like a hard choice, but at some point, like along the way, frankly, it doesn't really matter now. Like you could replace your car every six or seven months and it wouldn't slow you down. You know, it's, and, and, and I'm not, you know, it's, I'm not calling you to do that. Go get your Tesla if you want. I'm not trying to tell you not to, but I'm just saying there is this critical mass point at which the decisions, the groundwork that you've laid for yourself creates such incredible results that short of a black swan event, you're good to go. Yeah, you're right. But the interesting thing is it hasn't, it really has not changed our behavior, even though we have reached that point of critical mass, as you're calling it, which is fascinating. Like this has become so ingrained in us that this is just the way that we believe our lives are best lived. I think that's the best way to put it. And that's a really liberating feeling. But yeah, you're right. This, this has not been easy from day one. And I don't think it's easy for anybody from day one. You're changing the script of your life. And for us, we obviously took it to the extreme. We moved. I don't think many people have to move to pursue FI. I think that is really, it's funny, Jonathan. I don't think of it in my mind's eye as like, we did this extreme thing. But I guess when you really think about it critically, that was fairly extreme. But it was part of the life that we wanted to live for decades. So for us, it was an obvious choice. So I think people can clearly get on the FI path much easier than that, right? You focus on the things that you can control tomorrow, right? We talk about the food. Clearly cars are a huge one, but it's just looking at your monthly expenses, your recurring bills. What are you getting value out of and what aren't you? I think that's the easiest way for someone to get on the FI path. But for us, yeah, I mean, we we took a leap into a, a very deep end, right? You certainly did. And Richmond is very grateful and happy to have you here. You become a local hero. At least that's what they said in the the local coverage. Local Henrico man retires at 35. Yeah, it's a little weird to see that in print, obviously. But it's cool because that message I've found is really resonating with people locally here, which is so interesting. I know we actually just had a Chooseify Richmond local meetup last Thursday. And it was just like this impromptu thing. I, I mentioned it, I think, on the on the most recent roundup, actually, saying how one of our members said, hey, I'm new to town. Why don't we all meet up at Wegmans at like five o'clock? And it was five to seven. We had this kind of private room at Wegmans and there were like 30 plus of us there. And it was it was really amazing, Jonathan, to hear the changes that people have made in their lives. There was one doctor, actually, and I'd love to get her on, where she was saying in the last six months since she found Choose a Vi, she has like changed her life financially dramatically. She's lost, I think she said 32 pounds. She now, I guess at, at VCU Medical Center, she teaches new doctors who are getting ready to, to graduate. She teaches them finances. She actually, I think she said she bought 40 copies of the White Coat Investor book to give one to each of them in the class. How amazing is that? And she's like, you guys have inspired me, but it's not us. It's this message. It's this message of empowerment that you can make a change in your life. I guess we were in the paper a couple of weeks ago and I've seen probably 10 or 15 people come up to me just recently say, oh, I saw you in the paper. I started listening to the podcast. We actually just literally before we started hitting record on this, Laura and I got an email from two of the people on her PTA board who started listening to the podcast after they saw it on the Times Dispatch. And the one said, "She, this has hit her so hard, she's going to pitch an idea for us, confessions of a reformed 45-year-old overspender. And I mean, <laughs> right? Like, it's so cool to see people in your real life just by sharing a message with them. She, I noticed on my Friday post in the Facebook group of what was the one thing you did this week to make your life better, either financially, health-wise, relationship, whatever it may be. 
she wrote a comment. And it was just so cool to see someone who's just introduced, who's making a change or many changes in their life. You know, I was thinking about this, Brad. I was really thinking about when did this become a movement? And, and in my mind, it became a movement when it moved away from being like a guru telling you, hey, this is what works. And it became individuals that were so passionate about the changes that they were seeing in their own lives, wanting to share it around them. And that, in many cases, has been what's driven these local groups. And just to highlight this, Choose If I San Diego has a sold out yet free, you know, so just limited availability here. But they're doing an event with the Southern California group, Jillian from Montana Money Adventures, who actually, guys, I didn't, she's going to be coming on the show in just a few minutes. She's actually going to be speaking at that event. There's now at this point, there's actually a wait list for that. Choose If I Nebraska is having meetings every Every two months in February, they're talking about travel rewards in April. They're talking about long-term care and asset preservation, probate wills and trust in the Netherlands. They just started a new group in the Netherlands already have 20 members in Portland. They had a meetup every single month in 2018 with somewhere between 10 to 15 people at each event. There's a Northern Ireland group that just doubled their membership in the last month. And what I was really excited about in our Baltimore group, Alex, one of the admins, he's now actually taught, he's setting up mastermind group and accountability partnerships. And I've seen this start to spill over to other groups. What if you can tie mindset to action? What does it actually look like? And how does it transform not only your individual life, but it normalizes the conversation. This is just what you do. This is why it's a movement. And this is why every single episode we highlight that this is spreading. Yeah, Jonathan, it's amazing to see the local groups really take off. And like we've said in the last couple of weeks, this is a huge focus of ours for 2019 and beyond. It's just really cool to see all these events that are, that are going on. All right. If you've been hearing about these local groups, but you haven't yet joined one, to find a local group near you, just go to chooseify.com slash local. A list of all the groups and all the locations around the world can be found there. And if you don't see a group in your local geographic region, just send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com, letting us know what area of the country or the world you want to start a group in. And we would be more than happy to support that effort. All right, Brad. Well, I'm really excited about the second half of this episode. We ha are bringing on Jillian from Montana Money Adventures to help us talk about building a roadmap for your best life. And to our audience, for some context, Jillian joined us on the show back in episode 84. And we covered so many different topics, pursuing financial independence, starting with a lower income threshold, pursuing financial independence with a large family, and then minimalism as an essential tool for survival rather than as a luxury. And I know it resonated with our audience. We got incredible feedback on it. But the premise for this episode was actually a talk that Jillian gave uh, several weeks ago at Camp Fi down in Florida that Brad, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but frankly, you were just blown away. Yeah, I certainly was. I had high expectations of Jillian's presentation as it was. And yeah, it was even better than I had hoped. And it, it really resonated with me personally. And she talked about, about your superpower, knowing the things that you're capable of and the things that you do, but you hate. Like it, it was this, it was this incredible look at your working life, but your entire life. And that's how I really took it. And again, I, I had just a lot of deep thought about it and real conversation with Jillian offline. And now I'm excited to bring her back to the podcast. So with that, Jillian, welcome back to Choose a Vine. Man, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, let's just go right into this. You know, one of the things that to me was so impressive about your work at Montana Money Adventures is you've really started to flesh out like a roadmap to your best life. And I'm curious if you could kind of help our audience create a frame for some of the stuff that you've been developing and working through. Like if someone is going from kind of drifting, maybe they've started to get their finances in order. They feel like they have a little bit more bandwidth. What's next? Yeah, I think the next best step, once you're kind of out of that survival mode, after your head's a little bit above water, is to really start to focus on, on your values and your lifestyle. Why do you want to achieve FI? Like, what would that FI lifestyle be? Because oftentimes there are things that we can do on the way to FI to start to incorporate that sooner rather than later. Jillian, how do you suggest that people people really think about their life holistically. A lot of people are just in the day to day, but they, they clearly, they have to take a step back, right? Yeah. It's so important to set aside a little bit of time to do the deep thinking and the conversations and to kind of puzzle this out because we can be so busy, like just running from thing to thing that we don't have the bandwidth to really think about this in a deeper, more meaningful way. So I really encourage people to take 
as much time as you can. Like that might be going to coffee with a friend or your spouse. It might be a full day away, a weekend away, a, a full week, like whatever you can swing, take some time to think through this. And what did that look like for you personally? So obviously I, I could ask, oh, what, what works for people normally, right? I mean, you just had a whole list, but mm. it sounds like you have to figure out what works best in your own life. And I'm curious how you and your husband set up this roadmap for success in your own life. Yeah, we've always been super intentional about these things. Like I think if you don't have, especially if you don't have a ton of opportunities, in the first time I see our kind of shared that we didn't have high incomes and we started with debt and we we just weren't, I didn't feel like we had a tremendous amount of opportunities. So it's actually even more important that you're really, really wise and intentional with what you are working with. So we would we would go out to coffee every week. We would try to do kind of an end of year planning once a year. We would go on little marriage retreats for a weekend and do this kind of work. And Jillian, you know, I know you created this wonderful workbook and, you know, for people that are listening to this, that want to find out a little bit more about it, um, we've tried to make it very easy for you. You can just go to chooseify.com slash intentional, make sure you get your spell check, right? But it'll take you directly to that landing page and you've got this wonderful workbook. And I'm curious when you were creating this workbook, we talk a lot about mindset. We talk a lot about designing this lifestyle, but it's good in theory. Like how do we get somebody to, to actually do this? We know that our life will be better if we do this, but it just stays as, oh, that's a nice idea. Have you, have you contemplated and, and seen results with how do you get somebody to actually take action on the ideas that you're advocating for? Yeah, that was kind of the idea behind the workbook. One of the things I do on my site is I mentor people through work transitions. I'm kind of like a wedding planner for work transitions. So I had to develop a process that really worked for people that could help them think about, what do you want this five lifestyle to look like? What do we need to focus on now? Like, how do we actually make progress moving forward? So the first two lessons, um, kind of tying to what we were talking about, the life planning side, one of them is actually from David Bach. I read this in his, I think, Smart Couples Finish Rich, like 13 years ago, but it was Be, Have, Do. And you just list out, what do you want to be? Like fundamental to your identity. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be a cook or do you want to be identified as a writer or as an entrepreneur, as amazing father or a great friend? Then what possessions do you want to have? Uh, like, what are those things? And I really like people to focus on the things that facilitate that ideal lifestyle. You know, for me, I want to have a nice backyard because that's where my kids play. And that's where we invite people over and have barbecues. And that's where I like drink tea on the summer morning. And then lastly, what do you want to do? Like, what are those big activities or actions that you want to happen in your life before it's over. And so we focus on some of that life planning stuff to just cast the vision for the lifestyle, but it also, it kind of helps articulate those values in a roundabout way. Jillian, I'm always looking for, like Jonathan kind of alluded to there, how to take this into the real world. So I'm picturing myself. I want to sit down and do this. Do I sit down with my wife, Laura, and go through this together? Should we each individually do the exercise on our own and then come together and discuss it? Is there a perfect way or is, is this again, just whatever works for you? I think it's good to at least start thinking about it. But my kind of super ninja version of this is to be able to go away, um, like out of your house, either at a coffee shop or a restaurant. I mean, it's amazing if you can do like a night away at a hotel is kind of the perfect situation. Just get out of your environment. I'm obsessed with post-it notes. So I love doing this exercise on post-it notes and I do a different color for be, have, and do. And I just tell my husband, and we do it kind of side by side, just stream of consciousness, write one thing on each post-it note. And we just like go for like 10 minutes, 20 minutes until we have a hundred post-it notes. And then we start to organize them together and say, so, you know, what does he want to be? What do I want to be? Because there's some things that there's a lot of overlap and there's some things that are really different. And then one of the other exercises, I have like a five-year, three-year, one-year plan. I kind of combine those and say, well, what things go in what decade or what things go in what year? Because we can't, 
we can't do like everything today. Not everything fits in this year, but we can be intentional in that, you know what, this thing, this thing that we want to have, this is something for five years out or 10 years out, or this thing that we want to do, we're going to do this in three years. So Jillian, it's funny. Maybe it's the uh, the type A personality in me that I, I I try to tamp down a bit here. But I was thinking, oh, I've got to agonize over one or two items in each of these B have do. But you're you're saying this is like a free flow stream of consciousness. These are the hundred posters notes, and then you use it as a jumping off point for discussion. Is that am I hearing yes. you right? Yeah, absolutely. Just to get all of the ideas out there. Um, some of the other lessons in this workbook, one of them is the quit list. So everything that you're going to either, you're going to stop doing altogether, you're going to pause, like you were doing it, but you're going to kind of hit pause for right now in this season, or you're going to say not now. And so you can start with this big net and some things say, you know what, we really want it and it's so important to us but not right now. This is something that's going to fit better further down in our FI journey. Julian, you use the word season in there. And having spent some time with you recently, that's a word you use pretty often. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on seasons of life. Yeah. Every season of life, like financially and with our families is so different. And I just... I really focus on what's right for this season because so many things have expiration dates. You and I were talking, I did the 10 week trip last summer in a pop-up camper with my five kids and we did 10 national parks. My oldest was 10 at the time. And I felt that season and that chapter of our lives closing, you know, he was, we would get into another national park and he was like, um, mom, like, <laughs> is this one going to have Wi-Fi? Like, and I'm like, <laughs> No, it's not, buddy. And he was like, oh, I really miss my friends. You know, in this next season, I'm going to have like junior high kids and high school kids, and they're going to be in all the sports and working and doing all their things. And we can't maybe hit the road for 12 weeks in the summer. Like that season is different and we can do different things when my kids are a different age. I think Camp Fi, was it um, Joel from Fi 180 had a great presentation too. And he talked about, you can have a lot of the things you want, but the timing is so important. And that, yeah. that really resonated with me because that's my life. There's things that now that we're financially independent, now that we're a couple years into financial independence, it's not a big deal for us to buy. Like it doesn't, you know, we just bought a new camper, a new camper, it was like the most expensive thing I've bought other than a house. <laughs> and that would have been devastating when we only had $20,000 or $100,000 or even half a million of net worth. Now having almost a million dollars in net worth, it's it's kind of a blip on our story. You know, so interesting, Brad. It's kind of, and Julian wasn't here for that, but when we were talking earlier in the show, kind of, it's essentially front-loading the sacrifice. It's essentially, you know, making a hard choice versus an easy choice. But just as you get farther down the path, those things that could have crippled you earlier on, they make less of a dent. And it's just kind of interesting to hear you, Jillian, kind of mirror some of the, those same thoughts, which is awesome. And it gives hope that it's it's worth it. Yeah. And I think about it even not as, as a sacrifice, but like what fits this season of life? When I was about 24, me and my best friend did a cross country road trip, like coast to coast for a month. And it was so much fun, but we ate oatmeal from gas stations and we slept on the frozen ground in tents. We slept on a whole bunch of people's couches and we had so much fun, but now I'm 36 and that season has passed for both of us. I no longer sleep on the frozen ground. I try not to sleep on people's couches and I've got five kids and she runs a huge nonprofit and we can't do that trip again. So I'm so glad that I did it at 24, but now I get to do different trips. Yeah, I love this. And it's not looking back in sadness that these seasons are over. It's realizing that life moves on, right? And yeah. like with your kids, I mean, that hit me thinking about, hey, you never know when that season of their childhood is going to be over. But that doesn't mean things are terrible or that, oh, bad things are going to come in the future seasons. You make the best of things and you look for the beauty in each of these seasons of life. And yeah. I find that very empowering. 
Yeah. I encourage people to lean in and fully embrace that. You know, if you're in your twenties and you're like, I don't mind couch surfing and sleeping in youth hostels and like the tent on the frozen ground is my jam right now. Do that. Don't do like the luxury trip to Paris and like five store hotels. You can do that in your fifties. You'll love it in your fifties, but now each season has like such amazing opportunities. And, and I just encourage people like fully embrace where you're at in that season of life. You know, it strikes me that when you start being introspective like this and really, you know, customizing this life that you can get excited about along the way, you discover your superpower. And this is something that you've spent some time talking about. In fact, you even fleshed out a presentation around this. I'd I'd love to hear you break this down for our audience. Yeah. So the idea of the superpower is that, and I'm a little crippled because I'm obsessed with whiteboards. So I always draw this on the whiteboard. But you in the are workbook, a wonderful a illustrator. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a circle and I call it your circle of capabilities, like all of the things that you're capable of doing on kind of the outside of that are things that are just like, okay, like you can do it. It's fine. Not super impressive. If you draw a little X, like way outside of the circle, that's stuff that you probably shouldn't do. It just takes a disproportional amount of time or energy for you to do those tasks. But in the other little corner of your circle of capabilities, I call it your superpower. And those are things, there's a few different elements, different ways that we can look at it. One of it are things that we're passionate about. And passion is kind of a loaded word because it seems so big and intimidating and scary. Like it's one thing that you have to like find in a dense forest. But I think about it more as like things that you're curious about or things that you're interested in or things that kind of captivate your attention that you could move in that direction. One of the other things is your natural skill set. And I think about that as kind of your personality or your tendency or just the stuff that is easy for you that's not as easy for someone else. It might be the topics that you just pick up on faster. And then there's the things that create flow that just you really get caught up in and they're fun to do that kind of work. When you add a couple of these together, I call it your deep knowledge. Like you when you have like the passion and the skill set and the flow, you develop the hard skills and the soft skills and the information to really be proficient. I think about my kids and the things they're interested in. They are still struggling with like their multiplication, to be honest, and division. Like it's not coming easily. But Pokemon, they probably have like 150 Pokemon characters memorized because they're super interested in it. And so they put in the time and the work to memorize all of these things and they develop the deep knowledge. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I know when when I was listening to your presentation, it it reminded me of, of how do I search out these things in my life that I do have these, to use your word, superpower. How do I find those things where I have this passion or this natural skill set or the flow? I have found that at least for the things outside of, of this. So I actually am, am looking at it, Jillian, in a kind of an, an odd sense, actually, from trying to look for what are the things that I do, but as you say, but you hate. And I found my own mental trigger for that is when I have things that I procrastinate on in my life, then I know there's some resistance and sometimes I can't even figure out why, why that resistance exists. But I have become self-aware enough, let's say, to know that when I'm procrastinating on it, there's a very high likelihood it's not going to get done at this point, Yeah. right? Which is, is silly. Like it may be important. It may, I don't know, X, Y, and Z, like it should get done, but for some reason there's this resistance. So luckily with choose and with the team that we're building, I know that I can gum up the works because my Mm -hmm. way of, of showing this resistance is by procrastinating. So I've come to the conclusion. There are some things that, again, I have this superpower. Like I love doing this podcast. I love, we actually talked about this earlier in the episode. I love writing and communicating via email. So when Jonathan, actually it's interesting because you even break this down further and say, okay, my superpower is not starting the writing, but actually editing. So Jonathan, interestingly enough, takes the first pass at writing something and then I edit it and send it out. 
Jillian, honestly, like we are really doing this deep work that you're talking about here. So I know this works and it's made, Jonathan, it's made a big difference in our workflow, right? And if you ignored that, if you just kind of, if you didn't pay attention to that and you just tried to keep butting your head against it, I mean, I'm sure it would work and I'm sure that you would get better, but it wouldn't light you up. It would probably slowly yeah. crush you, which is why, like, why yes. am I doing this? And by acknowledging that, it allows you to really cultivate, I think I've even heard this term, your zone of excellence, right? It allows you to yeah. cultivate this and every and everybody, everything gets better. I mean, it just tr truly, you end up with a better product. You end up with a better work-life balance. It's just, it's a win for all parts involved when you start thinking about this, this superpower, essentially this list of capabilities and, and kind of separating it out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think procrastination is a great trigger to be mindful of because either procrastination, I think, stems from either it is kind of outside your zone of like those superpowers or the other thing that can trigger it, though, and I don't want people to be confused, is fear. Sometimes if we're afraid, even if it's in our superpower, like our superpower isn't even necessarily our comfort zone. You can do something that's in your superpower and be really afraid and really uncomfortable. So sometimes the fear will also create that procrastination because we have to confront it. But I think that procrastination is a great, a great trigger to look for. And Jonathan, you're right. The more that we lean into this, there's so many things that trip people up. Honestly, like coming from Montana, like we just do hard things. There's definitely this mindset of like, if you love your job and it's entertaining and it's fun and it fits your lifestyle and it reflects your values, like you're probably doing something wrong. Work should be hard and miserable <laughs> and like... For the record, that bosses. is not the choose a five position. That is not yeah. the Montana money adventure <laughs> position. <laughs> no. <laughs> but there's even bosses can get this mindset. Um, something I shared at, at Camp Fi, like that was a big part of my job throughout my career is I, I hired and managed a couple hundred people over a 10 year period. And it's so easier for employers to be like, well, I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if you're not good at it. It's your job. This is what I'm paying you to do. Just get it done. And that mindset can be so ingrained. Like we might've gotten it from our parents or our grandparents or a boss along the way that we feel guilty. We feel guilty doing the stuff that we're interested in and it comes easy and it's enjoyable for us to do. We feel like there's honor or dignity in doing the hard stuff that we hate. But how do you actually draw a line in the sand? I mean, you know, in order to really cultivate this superpower, you have to have some space, you have to have some time. And when you filled it all up with stuff that doesn't light you up, activities that really don't add value to your life to, to quit, like you, you have to quit something. How, how do you do this? How does one even start? Yeah, I think that quitless activity lesson is super helpful in that because you have to look at this. You can't do everything. You have to create some space. So what what can you just stop doing? What can you hit pause on? And the pause is something that is good. It does fit your ideal life. It does fit your be, have, do. It reflects your values. It's something you do want long-term, just not right now. So people might hit pause on a hobby or an activity or eating out or you know, one activity at work. And then, you know, what do you just say? Not now. We're just, it's not the right time now to create that space so that you can explore some of the superpowers a little bit more. For employers or employees, honestly, it's being really mindful of like, what is your employee superpower? Because now, you know, I'm building my own team. So I have some employees and I don't want people working outside of their superpower. It takes a disproportional amount of time and energy, aka my money, for them to do those tasks. I want them to tell me, hey, this is like so outside my zone, because even if I need them to do that for a few more weeks or months, that's going to be the first thing I take off their plate. Jillian, I know you work with coaching clients directly, and I wonder if you've ever run through like a script almost, or just a little exercise of this is how you approach this. Because I'm picturing myself sitting out in the audience and saying, this sounds amazing, but I am too scared to go talk to the VP in my department about superpowers, right? Like, yeah. it, you know, it almost sounds silly when I say it out loud. And I, I don't mean to minimize in any way, because I think this is utterly brilliant. But talk me through how you coach someone to even start that conversation. 
Yeah, the easiest first step, if you're, especially if you're kind of a traditional nine to five employee, is to raise your hand and take more things onto your plate that do fit your superpower. You don't even have to have a conversation or say anything to anyone. Just as projects, as new responsibilities come up that you're like, oh, like I'm super interested in that. I think that fits my personality. I think that might create flow. Raise your hand and take that onto your plate because you are going to go. I I believe our superpowers, we can go like four times farther, four times faster. And so you're going to be incredibly productive and successful in that thing. And then it's super easy to take something off your plate because you're like, wow, I'm being really productive in this new thing, but it's kind of crunching my time on this other project. This other project maybe can go to someone else or this other responsibility. And and that's something that's hard for people to sometimes wrap our minds around is that we think that everyone loves what we love and everyone hates what we hate. And the reality is like every job is somebody's superpower. And so by you doing it poorly, you're taking it away from someone who could be much more efficient and actually really love doing that task. Jillian, we've covered so much wonderful content, but I, I'm thinking for the individual that hears all these ideas and frankly, now they're just kind of in a state of overwhelm. Like how do they, how do they parse this and focus on the piece that serves them now? Yeah. One of, one of the really important lessons that I close with is I call it the could, should, want list. And literally just writing like on a piece of paper, three columns, all of the things that you could do, all of the things that you're capable of doing, because that's an enormous list. And then we have the should list, all the things that we should be doing. And this might be, you know, I I know I need to like repave my driveway and I need to paint my stairs and I should probably use more retinol at night or actually like start washing my face at night. Like there's all these things that in our head we know we should be doing in our work, in our lives, in our families. That should list can be really overwhelming. But kind of back to Brad's point on procrastination, there's this other list, the things that we really want to do. And I encourage people to write out that list of things that you genuinely want to do, you want to try, you want to explore. Because if you get like 50 things on that want list, not every idea is the right idea. Not every idea should happen today, but the things that we want to do, we make so much more progress than the things that we should do or we could do. I think about it like books that we want to read. There's a lot of books I could read. There's a lot of books I probably should read, but the books that I read really fast and I absorb and I think about are the books I want to read. So I think we just make so much more progress and it comes so much easier when we want to do something. So kind of separating all of those things out because they can get really jumbled in our heads. The things we could, well, I could do this. Well, maybe I should do this. Like someone else was successful because they did it this way. But but what do you want to do? And I would imagine there's so much value in just having the list on paper, like it being a tangible thing. Like I'm almost picturing myself mentally anchoring myself to that want list or just being more aware of it. I think we all in our minds have some sense of a few of the things that we'd want to do, but, but until it's concrete, until you've had that thought exercise of, Hey, this is really what I want my life to look like. This is what I want to do in my life in a multitude of different ways until it's on that piece of paper. I don't know that I would conceptualize it as, as well. And I think by having it on paper, I would focus more time and attention to it. Yeah, absolutely. It's in our heads. It can get so jumbled. Like there's only so many things that we can hold clearly in our mind's eye and just writing it all out so you can see it. And you, then you can investigate each thing for its own merit because especially I'm sure you guys know in creating an online business, there's so many things that you could do. And there's so many things that maybe you feel like you should do because it worked for someone else. But each project is such an undertaking and it can be so difficult and require so much energy that I think the only way we can push through and really be successful is if we have that desire, if, if it's on the want list, like I really want to see this happen. That's the stuff that we don't procrastinate. We don't give up part way through. Jillian, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been amazing. Thank you guys so much for having me. This was was a lot of fun. 
You know, Brad, I want to take just a couple minutes and tell a story that like we actually haven't talked about on the show, but me and you went to Chautauqua back in October and just had an, a truly amazing experience. So much incredible, both one-on-one time, but also small group time. And it, I mean, I think both of our lives were forever changed based on that experience, but it, it's so interesting. I really want your take on this as well. Both of us individually, individually separate instances went to Alan and Jim and said, you have you absolutely have to get Jillian from Montana Money Adventures to join you for a Chautauqua in the future. Yeah, this really was funny. And Alan's question to me, at least, was, hey, who do you think would be a good speaker in the future for a Chautauqua? And my mind instantly was Jillian. She's the one. AKA Neo. Yeah, she's like uh, <laughs> like an FI Neo. So, But I mean, she's just, she's amazing. You can hear it in her voice. She's just a rock star. She's amazing to spend time with. And the cool thing is Alan and Jim and Katie listened to what we had to say, and they actually invited Jillian to speak at this year's Chautauqua, which is incredibly, incredibly exciting. And yeah, it's cool. The tickets for Chautauqua, I guess, are going to go on sale on February the 3rd. So Jonathan, this episode is coming out on January the 25th. Jim and the crew said that for our audience, if you want to get on the Chautauqua mailing list, they're actually going to open up tickets to the mailing list a couple of days before that February 3rd date. So just head over to fichautauqua.com and we will have a link in the show notes. I know that's kind of a, a mouthful to spell there, but you can just Google FI Chautauqua and it'll come up and it's really very, very clear on how to get on the mailing list. But yeah, this year it looks like they're going to be four different weeks. They're going to be two in the UK and two in Portugal. So yeah, it looks like an incredible lineup. And, you know, as Jonathan, you and I know, they put on just an amazing, amazing week. It's, it really truly is transformative. And I'm just super excited that Jillian will be there for one of those weeks. And Brad, this was the part, I mean, we've talked about how powerful these conversations are. A one-on-one conversation with Jillian really applying these ideas and principles to a specific individual's case. I mean, that that's what I was visualizing when we talked about this so many months ago. And I think it's just is ever clear now. So for our audience, we know we did set up chooseify.com slash intentional, but honestly, at least in the short term, you can access this workbook that Jillian was talking about just on our homepage, montanamoneyadventures.com. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's going to bring this episode to a close. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. And there's three books that we offer. The first is J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. The second is Dominic Cortuccio's book, Design Your Future. And the third book, Vincent Puglisi, Freelance to Freedom. If you want to enter the drawing, all you need to do is just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes, follow the instructions there and leave us a short written review on either iTunes or Stitcher, and then send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. We give away one book for every five written reviews that we get, and we announce a winner on the Friday Roundup. Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have one winner today, and the winner is Frank, and he called this a very inspirational and fire gateway podcast. This is a solid podcast you can always count on twice a week. Appreciate the wide variety of guests and topics discussed. It's fun to listen to each episode and then follow up on the guests' websites and other material. It's a great starting point as they interview practically every authority on the financial independence scene. While Brad and Jonathan live the fire movement, they are not lecturing too much from on high. It's just (laughs) solid conversations, actionable tips, and inspirational stories. Brad, keep the lecture to the minimum. All right, guys, (laughs) the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.